This is what you want. How you going guys? Curtis from Cutting Edge Engineering. So today is going to be our last video of 2022. We have already shut down for the year so there will be no more work happening. But we thought this would be a great time to do another Q&A and announce some exciting news that we've been working on for the past couple of weeks. So it has been a massive year of growth for us with the business and creating content. This year we did manage to get a lot of projects ticked off the list. We did get our outdoor welding area set up and our igloo strung over that. We also managed to get the workshop expansion done so we gained a little bit more workshop, got our machines in a more usable sort of configuration and we took delivery of our new honing machine. So we did get a lot of projects ticked off the list this year but there is always more to be done we still have to finish off our kitchen and walker I also need to finish off a few bits and pieces on the hydroptic number no. 6 jig borer I did get Maddie from Maddie's workshop to make me some parts Maddie has a video about making all those parts on his channel I actually lost them during the workshop move around we have recently found them so they will also need to be fitted onto the machine and we're also hoping to get Maddie up in the not too distant future to help with the restoration of our clop shaper. So those are some of the projects we have on the list to do next year. But before we do those projects, there is one machine I really need to build. So we have pretty much designed 90% of it and the rest of the parts we can purchase off the shelf. But that will be the first project for next year. So it's been a big, big year with work, but it's also been a massive year with us creating content for YouTube and we have also branched out into putting our videos onto Facebook. So we are definitely ready for this break over the holiday season. We're not gonna go anywhere or do anything too exciting. We're just gonna stay at home and just chill out. Before we close the doors for this year, we're gonna do a Q&A on some of the most commonly asked questions that we have received throughout our videos this year. Right, so what's with the helicopter? The helicopter belongs to a businessman that works up the road from here. Because this is an old helicopter hangar and outside is still a landing area, he is free to come here and land and go up to his place of work whenever he wants to. So it doesn't belong to me, although I wish I owned it. It's not for part pickups, it's not for smoke o runs, it's just that this is a registered helicopter landing area and he's free to use it. Right, so another very common question is, does anybody else work here? Well, at the moment, it's Karen and myself and Homeless. I do have my brother contracting to help me with my 3D drawing and operation of the CNC. But other than that, it is just us. And at this stage, I'm not interested in bringing anyone else into the workshop to help me with the work that I do because when you have employees, you tend to have a few dramas because people don't care about your business as much as you do. The way it is now, I can keep the quality level very high. I have a good relationship with my customers and my customers are very happy and I don't have the added stress of running a daycare facility. So I'm just going to leave it, me in the workshop at this stage. And if you're wanting to know how I got started and what my background is, I answered those questions in our first Q&A. So go and have a look at that. So now with that out of the way, I'm going to get Karen to ask me questions and I will just give you my simple, honest answer. Why do you use air tools and not electric tools like electric grinders? Okay, good question. So I generally run air tools because when I was working out in the field, we didn't usually run electric anything except for our generators. We always had compressors on the trucks. Air tools were just a far less problematic tool to carry around with us. And they came with me into the workshop. I have shop air running all day, so it didn't make sense for me to go and buy electric rattle guns, electric grinders. More leads on the ground. More leads on the ground. Leads need testing and tagging and that stuff is not cheap. Here in Australia, a electrical tool needs to be tested and tagged every couple of months in order for them to meet safety requirements for the Australian standards. Running air tools, they don't require power. All they require is air. It is cheaper for me to just run air tools. So another thing with air tools, if you're comparing a five inch air grinder to a five inch electric grinder, Electric grinders are quite dangerous if you use them incorrectly. They don't tend to stall if the, something goes terribly wrong, where an air tool will actually stall and they are a much safer thing to use in a workshop. 
So then what air compressor do you use to run all your air tools and air hoses? So the compressor I use is a Pilot Air K50. It is a twin stage, twin piston compressor. It has a 270 litre air tank. It pumps out a lot of air. I generally run it at about 145 psi and it is good for about 40 CFM. So not only is it a high volume compressor, we also have an air dryer that is hooked up to the compressor. So it doesn't damage air tools. I don't get any moisture coming through the lines. So that just prolongs the life of all my air tools. Very good, I did not know that. When do you use coolant and why do you use it? Right, so coolant is one of those things that I would generally use when I'm drilling holes in something. When I'm doing sort of rough turning, I will use coolant, but really coolant makes a mess. Videoing when you're trying to machine with coolant is problematic because the coolant sprays over the camera lens. It's sort of one of those things with experience, you tend to know when you're gonna need it and when you don't need it. Well, some people say that running coolant prolongs the life of the tool, like your, your insert. And I agree with that, but sometimes I'd rather not make a mess. <laughs> Fair enough. So how did you drill and tap the hard jaws on your lathe chuck to fit your brass pads? Right, so the hard jaws on a lathe, they are pre-hardened and they are generally only hardened on the clamping faces or anything that's going to take any sort of impact. So you can drill and tap those. All you need to do is use a carbide end mill to spot the area you'd like to drill, get through that hardened layer, and it's only about a mil deep, and then you can drill and tap them like it's a normal piece of material. So nothing special, no voodoo magic there. It's just getting through the, the hardened bit so you can then drill and tap them. And then it was simple enough to just bend some brass shim material in order to fit around the face of the jaw and then you just bolt those on. With all the machining you do, what happens to all the metal chips and swarf? Do you recycle it all? Yes. So all of the swarf is recycled, it'll be collected at the end of a job or at the end of a shift and it will be transferred into our waste metal bin which then goes back to our metal recycler and it will be sent wherever it needs to go in order for it to be recycled into something else. Do you need to sort that? No. Pretty much all of our swarf and scrap material will end up in the recycling bin. So old cylinder rods, old barrels, old pins, any metal that can be recycled I'm able to put into that bin and then it will be sent back to our supplier and they will then melt that down and turn it into something else. With the jobs that you do, can you share how many hours it takes or how much it costs the customer? So that's not something I'm willing to share publicly because a job that I do today might be different to the job I have to do in 12 months time, even though they were the exact same job. If I have to charge a customer one thing and then in the next coming months, it is actually more expensive for material increase for uh, the price of material being increased, well, that could just end up with issues between myself and customers. And other competitors of mine could then take my pricing and underquote me in order to win the job. Another thing is why do we remake so many new parts rather than buy them brand new from the manufacturer? Well, obviously it's cheaper for me to make them new or the genuine part is not available. When you're using the Sir Mechanica to do bore welding, how come the wire doesn't get twisted when it's going around in a circle? The welding lance that comes with the machine, it has a rotary joint on the end of it that then attaches the welding lead onto the welder. So the rotary joint, it allows the lance to rotate with the lead staying perfectly still. So as the wire is passing through the lance, it does twist with the lance, but it doesn't seem to create any issues during the welding process. And when you're welding, what welding helmet setup do you use? So the welding helmet I use is a Speed Glass, which is a 3M product, and I use an Adflow helmet. So that is an air pack mounted onto my back, which supplies clean and fresh air into the welding helmet. The reason I use a Speed Glass helmet is I have used them from the very beginning. I know there are many different brands of helmets on the market with their own breathing apparatus. Once you find something you like, you generally stick with it. And the consumables for the ad flow and the helmet I can get from a couple of hundred metres down the road. So while we're talking about welding, why don't I weld barrels up on a table or up on a stand? I have seen people injured from doing that exact process and that is because they're not aware of what's happening around them and their earth lead might tangle around the job while it is rotating 
and it either turns a welder on its side or it pulls the job off the rollers. When I do it on the ground, it hasn't got far to fall if that was the case. A lot of my jobs, you're not welding for five or 10 minutes. You could be sitting there for a couple of hours welding up a cylinder barrel. While you are welding, you're generally unaware of what's happening outside your welding helmet. So potential issues can happen. I did have a case where I had a bearing in one of my rollers lock up and the job actually climbed out of the rollers and landed on the ground. Not only is it a safety thing, but it's also, I'm very limited for room. And a welding bench is just another one of those tools I would have to store here in the workshop. I don't need something that's four and a half meters long by 900 mil tall. Sitting in the middle of the workshop, that's just gonna take up space. When you're drilling, why don't you use a pilot drill before using your big drill? So a lot of the times when I'm drilling a hole, I'm not looking for accuracy. I just need to remove material so I can then finish it to size with a boring bar or a ream. So by drilling a pilot hole, that would just be an added process, which does take time and it wouldn't actually achieve anything. Only time I would generally pilot is if I was trying to achieve accuracy with a twist drill, I would generally match up my pilot drill to that distance across the point of the drill itself. That will help keep the drill in alignment. If you use a larger diameter drill than that distance across there, it still allows the drill to walk around a little bit. So do you sharpen your own drills? Yes, so we do sharpen our own drills. I do have a drill doctor for doing the smaller drills from one to 13 millimeters. I then have another grinder I use to sharpen drill bits. If we're really busy in the workshop and we have a large amount of drills that need to be sharpened, I will send them away to one of the local sharpening companies and they can do them for us and return them within a week or so. But yes, we do sharpen our own drills when we need to. Can you make a video on that? I could make a video, but there are more than enough videos on YouTube of people explaining and demonstrating on how to sharpen a drill. So I don't think I, don't think I really need to put any time into that. For all the viewers who want to know what type of tools you use or what brands or what that tool is that you're using, how can they find that out? We are going to create a web page with the common tools that I use here in the workshop and where we get them. Although a lot of the tools I get are from local companies, they're probably not available all over the world, but we'll put together the list of tools, where we get them from, and you may have to find a supplier in your country so where you can actually purchase them from. So this was a very common question on a recent video. And what is with the drift car? Please <laughs> tell everyone, do you, do you still have it? Where is the new car? Right, so yes, I used to be into drifting. I don't actually have that car anymore. I haven't been in the drift scene for a very long time. That was a 2001 Nissan 200SX, also known as an S15. It was basically stock standard when I bought it and I spent a lot of money on it. Nothing was left standard on that. We built it for the sole intention of going sideways. So the engine was an SR20 DET. It was a full stock bottom end, but we did all the work to the head. So massive cams, massive valves. We went all out with the top side of that engine. It had a 3540 turbocharger on it, screwing nearly 35 pound into the engine. Plasma man, plenum chamber, PWR intercooler and radiator, all the boost controllers, the list goes on. But that car was producing 450 horsepower at the tyres when I had finished with it. Every control arm, every steering arm, anything suspension related was changed out for all new aftermarket parts. So everything could be fully adjusted. It had massive brakes on it because I wanted that car to stop as quickly as I got it to speed I needed it to stop. It had a full bolt-in roll cage, I think it was a 10-point cage, bride Zeta 3 seats, Takata harnesses, Defi gauges, it had everything. Curtis is getting emotional. I am. <laughs> So I, I built that car from the ground up. I was very happy with where it got to. I had a lot of fun in it and we used to do a lot of drifting in the mountains in the early hours of the mornings when there was no one around and it was a great heap of fun, but it was, it was time I grew up in life. I did need to buy a house and then that was the house that we sold in order to start our business. So although it was a very sad day, it did end up creating much more for us in the future. Are there any videos of you drifting? So I don't believe there are any videos. That was probably pre the iPhone era. So 
any sort of footage you probably would have got from a Nokia 6210 or something. Are you going to get another drift car? I haven't ruled out not getting another drift car. I sort of don't really have the time for toys at the moment. We are still trying to build our business. I'm not saying it's off the cards altogether, but at this stage, I'm not interested in building another drift car. So the last question and one of the most commonly asked questions is, can we do more than one video a week on YouTube? So for the past few years, we have really just tried to stick to doing one really good quality video per week. We know everyone would love to see a lot more videos. There is a lot more we can actually show you. The filming does drag jobs out a little bit longer, but it is the editing that takes days in order to get that right for us to put it up on YouTube. And this platform has limitations on such things as extreme profanity, music playing in the background, and our channel has been affected by this before. So it does make it quite difficult to film and edit an extra video per week. Because of those limitations, we have decided to launch a Patreon community where we can share a lot more of our content and work workshop projects there won't be as much editing in it and it just be a lot easier for us to share it so it's going to be a little bit different to YouTube there's going to be cases where I take the camera and I run you through the jobs just so I can give you a different point of view on how I go about jobs on a day-to-day -day basis and there might even be times when I'm not here in the workshop I've got a job to do out in the field and I can take you along with me so there's going to be a lot of perks and benefits there's going to be behind the scenes and sneak peeks into upcoming projects and what we are working on and it's going to be stuff that we're not going to be uploading to YouTube. If you've been wanting more content, it's now going to be available through our Patreon. So if you're interested, here's the link so you can go and check that out. So hopefully that answered a lot of the questions you guys have. We're looking forward to bringing you more content in the year ahead. So enjoy your holidays. Have a happy new year. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Right, are you ready? Yeah. How, how should I start that? Oh, Lord help me. You can't help you. So we've already shut down for the year. Oh, fuck, where are we going with that? <laughs> what are you trying to say? I don't know. I'm just starting in. Where, just, where did I start that? We did take delivery of our new honing machine. That is perfect and up and running now. Duh. We also got our workshop expansion completed. You ready? Yep. <laughs> right, so, fuck off wind. There's gonna be cases, oh, fuck's sake. I can turn that off. What? Yeah, I can, I can actually turn that off. I do have the Nissan Ute. Your the, work Ute. The Navara, so. In the wet, it goes sideways around a roundabout. I'll just have to settle for trying to drift the forklift. So we stuck with doing one video a week that we could, you know, give it a... Mm. Right, so for the past... Mm. Where are we going with that last bit? I don't know. And the editing does take a lot of time, so... Oh my God, what takes a lot of time is editing Curtis's words out. Duh. What? What now? I don't know, what now? Oh my god. I was going good. Yeah, so keep going. I need more help. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Watch me go. One of the other issues is there, there isn't as no, uh, And one of the other issues is Karen can only edit one video per week because I'm really shit at talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to restart. I'm going to restart. <laughs> Let's just do this sentence by sentence. <laughs> Yeah, right. We should have done a live Q&A. Oh, fuck, really? <laughs> no. Come back. <laughs> Is he coming back? <laughs> it's alright, guys. I'm getting a lift. <laughs>